Thank you. Good morning. So, digital predator or digital prey? Every single company in this room today will be one of these two things by 2020. Now, which do you want to be in? My guess is you want to be in a company that's a digital predator and not digital prey. At least I would hope that's the case. So what I'm going to do with you this morning is share with you some of the results of our latest research that looks into what makes a digital predator. My aim is to help you help your companies become a digital predator and avoid becoming digital prey. And the tagline that you saw at the end of the little video there, challenge thinking lead change, I try and do one of, the, one of those two things today, at, at the very least, challenge your thinking. Hopefully leading to a change in the way you think about what you do every day and your role in the company to help create and drive revenue. So why do I say digital predator or digital prey? Robin Redbreast, a predator, right? The early bird that catches the worm. We all know from a worm's perspective, the robin is a predator. So the challenge with predators, and this is true in the business world, is we don't always know where the predators are coming from and who the predators really are. The company that may appear to be a predator may in fact be the prey. And a lot of times that's because the prey comes from somewhere we're not looking, not expecting, right? Unexpected prey. And so when a lot of, a lot of uh, CIOs, CMOs will ask me, well, what are other companies doing in our industry? Well, my usual response is that's the wrong question. You should be asking what are companies doing in other industries that we can learn from and apply to our industry? Because usually the, the transformation that comes about when we see digital disruption is because somebody takes an idea from another industry and says, what if we apply that differently in this industry? And What's driving all of this disruption, of course, is all of these digital experiences that we as people, as human beings, we're experiencing these digital changes every day of our lives. So last week I just stayed at a hotel where I could unlock my room door with my smartphone. That's a new digital experience. And that new experience changes my expectation a little bit. And it's all of these different expectations, these different, different digital experiences, that change how we consider and perceive value. It's really important to understand that. When we ask executives how much digital will influence sales today and by 2020, what we see is a lot of executives believe that digital is going to influence more than half of their sales by 2020. That's a huge shift in the balance of power in terms of what has traditionally been the thing that influences sales most, right? which is developing better products and figuring out how to market and sell them, the way we typically brought products to market. So we're seeing that digital is starting to change the business world significantly. And when you look at the breakdown by industry, you can see that some industries are expecting a higher percentage by 2020 than others. So for example, Retail is uh, among the highest. Telco is high on the upper left. But if you look at the bottom right, it's sort of industrial products. Industrial products, 47% of revenue influenced by digital by 2020. That's a huge shift in what is typically a B2B market. In fact, B2B is where some of the biggest shifts we're seeing are expected to come in the next few years. And it's not just sort of the small, digital, savvy companies that are doing, expecting these changes. When we ask large company you know, executives what are the uh, expectations of digital transformation you have in your organization, the executives of large companies typically say they're expecting more disruption than those in smaller companies. Which kind of makes sense, right? If you're, if you're a big company and you've got a large market share, you're vulnerable to a much greater extent to disruption in the industry. So those executives understand that the, the world is changing. Now you figure, with all of this change that's going on, executives would have a strategy, right? They'd have a digital strategy. So we ask executives, are you prepared, right? Is your company prepared for this change that you can see coming, that you know is happening today? Are you prepared for that? 
The answer's not so good. 26% right? of CEOs set a clear vision. So the executives say, we asked the executives, you know, does your CEO set a clear vision of digital in the company? And only 26% really feel confident that their CEO sets a clear vision. So there's a lot of work to do around communicating the vision of what the company can be as a digital company. When you look at the number of companies that actually understand how to use digital to create new sources of value for a customer, only around a quarter of companies really get that. And when you ask about the culture, and we know that culture is one of the biggest barriers to transforming any large organization, only 21% of executives really say they have an understanding of the culture and how to change that to allow it to thrive in support of a digital organization. What about the people? The people defining the strategy, well, very few companies have the right people defining strategy. At least the executives don't feel confident they've got the right people defining strategy. And when you actually look at the technology, something that many of us in this room are concerned about, very few executives feel confident they have the right technology in place today to drive that transformation. So the good news is there's a lot of opportunity, right? There's a lot of opportunity to help change the company. There's a lot of opportunity for everybody in this room to be a key component of that change in the organization. But it requires a change of mindset. It also requires building new capabilities, new people capabilities. And when you look at the people and skill sets, business executives generally don't believe that we have the right skill sets across the enterprise, not just in the technology group, but across the enterprise to be able to support digital transformation. So there's a big awareness that we have to build new skills, develop new skills, acquire new skills. And by the way, everybody is, is currently acutely aware of the technology talent war there is out there because it's very hard to find people with the right skill sets. And processes inside the organization were not designed for the digital era. Now, the simple truth is, we think about processes. We've been doing process reorganization and redevelopment and redesign for the last 20 or 30 years with technology in mind. It's enabled a lot of improvement in, in process efficiency. But the processes in our organizations were really designed fundamentally for a, an era that was 200, 250 years ago, the Industrial Revolution, where we basically had a low-skilled workforce we had to bring into the organization and help them produce at a massive scale around the world high quality products. And we've refined and refined that over the last 250 years. But that kind of process, the design of the organization, is, is designed to do one thing very well, to consistently produce output around the world at high quality and relatively low cost efficiency, but not to change. Because in order to get that consistency, it's designed to not change very quickly. It evolves, but doesn't change quickly. And what we're seeing today is the need to change very, very quickly. I'll come on to why in a minute. But the, the, the fact is that the processes that we designed were not designed to change quickly. So in order to evolve our business to work in a world where you need to change very quickly, we need to fundamentally rethink the processes inside the business. So there's a lot of opportunity there. So that comes to the question of, are digital predators different, right? Are the companies that we call predators, are they different? Well, first of all, how do we define predators, right? So we need to understand what is different about them. So one of the things that we did in our latest research was to take a look at companies that say they're driving a high percentage of their revenue today through the influence of digital. We call those companies predators. And the companies that are actually driving a relatively low percentage of, of influence of value and sales and revenue through digital today, but expect to increase that significantly by 2020, let's call those transformers. And the companies that are doing neither of those two things, they're doing a some level of digital, but not expecting it to transform the organization by 2020, we'll call those, for want of a better term, dinosaurs. Because Frankly, if they don't change and evolve, they're at risk of becoming extinct. Future prey. And what can we learn from 
breaking down the sort of the numbers and the data behind this to see how they behave differently. Well, one of the things we see right up front that pops out is that the leadership inside the predators are really good communicators. They, they communicate across the organization about what it means to be a digital business, what it means to create value for customers. And so they stand out as communicators in their organizations because every employee inside that organization understands where they're going and why it's important to do what they do. So communication, how the leadership sets the vision and paints that vision, tells the story to the employees, becomes really critical as a predator. What else? Well, we asked about the critical success factors for these companies. We asked executives to rank all the different success factors for the companies. And what's really interesting is predators see, that, that a, lot of, a lot of executives obviously see the same kind of success factors and revenue and profitability is in all companies. But executives at digital predators see the world slightly differently in terms of how they prioritize things. The number one success factor is actually two. It's this ability to create new sources of value for customers through digital, and the ability to create world-class customer experiences. These two things, when they're combined, effectively reflect a, a unique customer obsession for these companies, for executives in these companies. They are customer obsessed. They're not just saying customers are important. They're customer obsessed. They live, breathe, and think about what it is that means, it means to create value for their customers every minute of every day. That's their number one success factor. I interviewed the CEO, or the former CEO, at Evernote a while ago. And I was asking him about how they do their innovation and, and how they think about product evolution. And I remember one thing stuck in my mind that he said that was really sort of memorable. And it was the fact that they don't actually look at their competitors. They don't have time to look at their competitors. They look to their customers and what their expectations of their customers are and try and keep up and stay ahead of those expectations. And that is all consuming. They have no time left to look at what their competitors are doing because they're hyper-focused on what it is their customers are expecting them to do. So this, uh, this world-class world sort of focus on customer experience and creating value for customers is really important. And we know that customer experience is very valuable to a company overall. So Forrester does this, uh, this um, data survey we do every year, and it looks at the, the perception of, of brands around the world. And we produce this customer experience index. And the customer experience index essentially ranks the brands based on their customer experience. And we've been doing this for eight or nine years now. And the, this company called Watermark Consulting, who's an independent consulting company, they take the winners, the leaders of the customer experience index that we publish every year, the public companies in that group, and they build a portfolio of investments out of those companies. And they take the laggards, those companies at the bottom of the group, and they build a portfolio of investments out of the laggards. And they compare them. And they rebalance the portfolio every year after the new index comes out. And, and by the way, this is not investment advice. Please be clear on that. <laughs> but they, the results show, every single year they do this, it shows that the customer experience leaders significantly outperform the S&P 500. And the laggards significantly underperform the S&P 500. Now, I love this, this graphic because every time a CFO says, well, the, you know, where's the ROI on investing in customer experience? Because that's kind of, it's a bit airy-fairy. I mean, it's all that soft stuff. And, and I, can't, I need to see a hard ROI. And the fact is that any single customer experience sort of project that you do probably in itself may not show a hard ROI. But over time, this graphic shows that those companies that's, that invest consistently in customer experience will outperform the market. And for CFOs, that's a really important number to understand. The thing is about customer experience is that 
those experiences we have change our perception and our future value perception. So I mentioned that experience of opening my hotel door with a, with a smartphone, right? So now when I go to a hotel and they don't allow me to do that, I have a slightly diminished experience. If I expect to be able to do it and I can, cannot do it, my expectations have been raised, and now I expect the next hotel to be able to do that. So I have a slightly diminished experience. And that means that I have a slightly diminished perception of value. Now, it may not be enough in itself to change where I stay in, in, in my hotel choice, but it is the number of those changes of experience that change how we think about value overall. And so when you're thinking about your company's products, you are selling your products and services to a customer, a buyer of those products and services. They have a perception of value associated with your products and services. And that buyer may or may not be the person that uses the products or services. So there may be somebody else who actually uses the products or services you sell. And that person who's using those products or services, that person actually has a perception of value as well. And our perceptions of value are shaped not necessarily by just the products or services we're using, but by all the digital experiences that we have around us today. So we're starting to get into a, a, a state now where we expect digital experience to be part of every product or service we have. And they're shaping our future value perceptions in a way that changes how companies deliver value to customers. In fact, the new business paradigm is, is kind of shaped by this understanding that the experiences that we create shape those expectations, and that to the degree to the which the experiences deliver the outcomes that our customers most need and value, they shape the value perception. They shape the perception of how valuable that product or service is. Now, if we're trying to create revenue and drive revenue, then it's really important that we deliver things that actually satisfy outcomes that, value, that, that are valuable to customers, because that's what they're willing to exchange, something of value to us in return. Now, that might be money, right? So what they're exchanging value might be revenue. They pay for a product or service. Or it might be time. Right? They're willing to give us their time, and we can monetize that through advertising. Or they might be willing to share their data, right? and, and we can monetize the data. So the things that are value to us, they're willing to exchange for things that are value to them. So it's really important to think about how we create those experiences that deliver the outcomes. Now, predators create customer value with digital in a way that, that transforms and dinosaurs don't quite get there yet. So one of the questions we ask is, do you have a digital strategy? And then we ask executives to define how they think about their digital strategy. What is it that, that that digital strategy does? Now, that first response there, we have a full strategy in place that defines how our business will create customer value as a digital business, defines how we're going to create customer value. That's a fundamental shift in thinking in the organization. Predators overwhelmingly select that as how they think about digital. Transformers and dinosaurs, by comparison, select that we have a limited strategy in place that adds digital elements to the existing business model. In other words, they take the current business model and say, how can we apply digital to enhance it? So what does that look like in reality? Well, if you think about this little schematic of a, a building here is today's business. The way most companies approach digital today is kind of this. They kind of attack digital onto the side of, of the organization. In other words, we'll keep the company as it is, but we'll create some digital capabilities. We'll add something to it. Maybe add a mobile app or an e-commerce capability. So this, this is kind of like, do you remember when you, um, when you wanted to get your first car? So when I wanted to buy my first car, you know, as a typical teenage, teenager, I, you know, I wanted a red Ferrari. Who, who didn't want a red Ferrari, right? So I wanted a red Ferrari. I didn't have a trust fund, so I couldn't get a red Ferrari. So what do you do as a, as a teenager? You go out and buy the car you can afford, right? So you get the car you can afford, and you do what? You kind of paint those go faster stripes on it, right? We paint the go faster stripes because we know that helps the car go faster, right? I mean, that's kind of how the teenage mind thinks. So you paint the go faster stripes on it. If you want it to go really, really fast, you get a spoiler, right? And you stick the spoiler on the back. And the bigger the spoiler is, the faster the car goes. That, that's kind of the way it works, right? 
So that's what we've been doing with business. We've been kind of painting the go faster stripes on business with digital. We've been taking the existing business and saying, okay, well, we want to we wanna paint those stripes on it. We want to make it a digital business. Let's build a mobile app. But the simple truth is with the car, if we wanted to make that like the red Ferrari, you know, make it a sports car, we'd have to fundamentally transform the car, right? I mean, we'd have to take the engine out, replace the engine, the gearbox, the drivetrain, the suspension, the brakes, the tires, the wheels, probably change the aerodynamics. We may even want to paint it red. Right? We'd have to fundamentally transform the car to get it to be a sports car. You can't just paint the stripes on it. And that's the thing about digital transformation that most CEOs and business leaders don't get, is that they think that they can just paint the go faster stripes on the business and say we're digital and we're done. And that misses the huge opportunity that's out there. Because digital transformation is, is not that bolt-on approach. It's a fundamental shift in how firms deliver value and drive revenue. It's a really different way of thinking about the business. Now, what does that look like? Well, it's, it's, a, it's really about thinking about how you change the business paradigm. It doesn't mean that products and services are not relevant. They are. But what is increasingly more relevant is that we need to design the experiences that deliver the outcomes that satisfy the desires. And we need to build the products and services around that paradigm. And it's a really different way of thinking about how we create value for the customer. And it's when we create value in this way that we can disrupt markets and we can drive new sources of revenue and drive new revenue models inside the industries we're in. This is the hardest thing to do, however, because this challenges a lot of the existing business structures we have. Even from the point of view of how most large organizations have business units that are broken down to P&Ls. And the P&L owners inside those businesses are very often product-centered. Right? If you think about your business units, very often they're product-centered. Or they may be market-centric. But very few are actually customer-centric designed to deliver particular customer outcomes. And until a company can rethink that, there's a lot of internal conflict that has to be overcome. And when you think about customer experience, you need to understand that it's not just the cool digital experiences on the outside that we need to think about. It's about the operational excellence that goes behind that, that has to create the agility in service of customers. You see, we, we can create great experiences, but if the agility is not there inside the operations of the business to constantly change and evolve with those experiences, then as those digital experiences evolve quickly with customers as they are doing today, the business isn't designed to change and, and, and adjust to deliver those new experiences. So the operations start impeding the ability to, to satisfy that experience. And so we've seen that digital predators are very focused on creating agility inside the organization. They're focused on creating the ability to change and evolve constantly, to adapt to changing customer experiences, to learn to create new sources of value, not just today, but tomorrow and the day after that. So companies that are doing this very often do it through what look like bolt-ons, but then can evolve, right? So if you take an example of direct energy in the USA, they're an energy supplier. It's a boring utility, right? I mean, how many times do you go out and change your electricity supplier? Probably not that frequently. But they built a website to allow people to go and do that online. They can buy their plan online. Now, what's really interesting is those two plans on the left, they include a Nest thermostat. Now, why would you include a Nest thermostat inside the, uh, inside the plan well, if you're, utility, if you're a utility company, it's kind of important to understand the cost of power generation. You see, that Nest thermostat allows direct energy to participate in something called rush hour rewards. Now, in the UK, we don't have this overwhelming need for air conditioners running a lot of the day. In the US, that's a huge problem. And they get heat waves that produce peak demand spikes on electricity. And so the energy providers have to produce what's called peak energy. Now, peak energy is very expensive to produce. They can't produce it with their normal power output. They have to ramp up extra power output that's expensive to do. So 
they, don't, they want to avoid doing that. And they avoid doing that in ways that allow them to, to reduce their overall cost. So rush hour awards allows the uh, energy company to say to Nest, we're expecting a rush on uh, energy, peak energy, between these hours. And for the subscribers that sign up to it, the Nest thermostat will automatically pre-cool their home or their business, and they'll cycle the demand on and off over the period of time. And that smooths out the demand for the energy supplier. It lowers the amount of peak energy they have to produce. And so they can give that value back to the customer because they're saving money, and they can return that to the customer in terms of a rebate. So the energy company wins, the customer wins, and Nest wins because they get a more engaged, happier customer. It's a win-win it's scenario. It's an ecosystem of value that has enormous value for every player in the ecosystem. The number three success factor we see for predators is actually three things together. Security, vision, and talent. All three were tied for, th for effectively uh, third place. So when you think about this vision, painting a vision about what it means to be a digital business, to transform the organization, very few CEOs can, uh, I can point to better than Jeff Immelt at, at uh, GE. For the last 10 years, GE's been on a transformation journey. They've poured billions into changing an industrial era organization to becoming a digital player, a digital business. And, and Jeff Immelt's been on the road communicating not just to employees, but to people outside the company what it means for GE to change. In the US, they've been running a lot of advertising, I don't know if they've been doing it in the UK, about how to, uh, why programmers, essentially, programmers would want to go and work for GE as a digital company, as a digital business, because they're trying to attract the talent. They're trying to solve that talent war as well. But the ability to paint that vision about what it means to be a digital business is an important challenge for every organization. And CEOs have to understand that challenge. Security is also critically important because as you start creating value through digital experiences for, for customers, whether it's B2B or B2C, or your customers' customers, if you're selling to another business that's providing a consumer product or service, as you're creating that value, the ability to store securely that customer information is really important in terms of the ability to trust the company, right? Trust is an inherent, perception, an inherent component of perception of value. If a company loses that trust because their organization gets hacked and the customer data gets lost, there's a huge devalue in the perception of the minds of the customer, right? They think about the value that they're getting from the company and it goes down. And you only need to look at some of the CEOs of companies uh, who've had these major breaches to see the impact, because many of them don't have their jobs anymore. So security is critical. We have to safeguard that customer data as if it's the lifeblood of the company. And then talent, right? How do we get the talent that we need into the organization that we're going to need for the future? And this is a real problem for many organizations. Working with universities and colleges to bring them on in terms of uh, internships, industrial training placements, sandwich courses, to help them understand what it is that we're doing inside the organization and why we're a great company to participate with and, and learn with. We need to change the, the paradigm to attract people in early, but we also need to rethink about our existing employees. How do we get the existing employees to become more digitally savvy? We don't want to be building a two-tier system of technology. We don't want to have the haves and the have-nots inside the IT organization. We need everybody in the IT organization to understand what it means to be a digital business and to change the way we think about what it is to be a technology service provider inside an organization. The role of technology inside an organization is not to provide great technology that drives efficiency in the organization. That's a byproduct. The role of the technology organization is to create value for customers that drives revenue. Use technology to create value for customers to drive revenue. That is why we come to work every day. And if that's not why you come to work every day, I suggest you rethink your, your paradigm about why you come to work because you need to think about the end customer. So how do you move from predator to insights into action? Right, so we need to think about what can we do. The first thing to understand is marketers have been asking the wrong question for many years. How many marketers in the room? 
Not many, I guess. One or two. OK. So as marketers, one of the questions we've been asking for many years is, what are our customer needs? That's the wrong question. Needs do not equal desires, right? If you think about the car, the car analogy a little bit, the basic need for a car is to go from A to B, right? We, some of us may have a different sort of need, and we may have children we have to shuttle around, so we need a number of seats in the car. But the basic need is to go from A to B. But how many of us in the room actually drive exactly the same car? Probably very few. The reason why we don't drive the same car is we actually have desires. We have emotional desires built in that cause us to buy a particular brand and a particular model of car that satisfy our personal desires. Emotion is a huge reason why we buy a particular product or service. And that's true in B2C and B2B. The buyers of products or services in B2B are emotionally driven. And anybody who's been around buying and selling and doing RFPs for technology will know that many companies will figure out a way to get the answer that they want in the company they want they select. It's never just about the data. Desires drive purchase. So you have to think about how to connect to the emotion. What is the outcome that the customer wants that values? Now, if you think about farming as an example, what's the outcome farmers want? Well, they need to actually plant seeds. They need to go buy seeds. They need to buy fertilizer, pesticides, etc. So yes, they have a need to buy product. But the outcome they want is actually high yield. That's the outcome they want. So if you can create experiences that deliver that outcome, high yield, you have something of value to farmers. So companies like Pioneer's, uh, uh, DuPont, DuPont's Pioneer division, which is their agri division, they created a data service that pulls together a lot of data from different sources, whether pests, pests um, pests actually pass through, through countries like weather, who knew, that they can predict where pests are going to be. Disease does the same thing. They bring all this data together. They look at the topography of farms. And they can help farmers figure out what density to plant seeds at, how much water they need to use for irrigation, how much fertilizer they need to plant, uh, put on it when, and when they need to apply pesticide. And that helps the farmers get to higher yield. And that has huge value for the customer. So thinking about how we actually drive the outcome that has value to the customer is an important part of digital transformation. What it really comes down to is this equation, right? The experiences that we deliver based on what, what we're delivering toward the outcome, the experiences over the expectations equals the perceived value. If our experiences are, are higher than the expectation, would you, we produce higher perceived value. If our experiences are below the expectation, we produce lower perceived value. Now, the, the challenge is that the expectations are changing, right? If those expectations are going up all the time, we have to constantly improve the experience, which is what's driving the need to constantly change in the organization. We need to constantly evolve those experiences in order to maintain the value. We have to learn how to create great experiences for the customer and turn that into money to drive revenue either by direct sale or by exchanging things that are value to us, like data and time. We have to understand, though, that those desires of the customer evolve over time. Right? So if you're selling to a company or a customer, and you want to have that customer for the lifetime of the individual, if it's a B2C company, let's say, and you're selling to a customer and you want to keep that customer for the lifetime of the customer, it's important to understand that those desires change over our lifetime, right? We, we go through periods of, uh, in our life which fundamentally change our desires. Getting to the freedom piece is very important. So understanding how to change the desires, identify the outcome that satisfy the desires. What are those outcomes that the customer is going to value? And then how do we actually design the experiences that deliver those outcomes? And can we change the experiences we have today in some way that will help deliver better outcomes to the customer? Now, sometimes that is through these bolt-on projects that we do around the business. But understanding that we can do multiple bolt-ons that get to that overall outcome is very important, because that helps us figure out, well, which bolt-on is more important to do? And when, does a, when, when you do multiple bolt-ons that get towards changing the way you do business, 
over time, you transform the business into being a different business. And understanding that those ecosystems, think of that direct energy example, those ecosystems of value that we have are important to understand. Now, every one of us who has a smartphone, if you think about your smartphone, you have a personal value ecosystem that you created. You have a number of apps on your phone. If you're anything like me, you probably have way more apps than you use, right? But you, you have a number of apps on your phone that you use on a regular basis. That's your ecosystem of value. Now, you decide which companies are in that and which ones are out, and it's all based on whether or not those, those apps actually help you get to the outcome that you value. That's your personal value ecosystem. To the extent that you understand your customer's personal value ecosystem, who's in it, how they're using it, and how can you play in that to increase value will help you understand how to drive revenue in the future. Companies like Lowe's in the US are using things like HoloLens to test whether or not they can create value for customers by giving them a virtual reality view of uh, a kitchen design, for example. Now, it may be that that project itself can never show an ROI, but what they're doing is creating value for their customers. But they're learning how to do that in a way that increases their digital DNA. They're driving this innovation across the organization, but they're learning to do it in a way that when they get to the next evolution of the technology, they'll be ready to take it and deploy it very quickly because they're already experimenting with it. They're already learning the ups and downs of that technology. And you can see how companies are scaling these, these digital experiences to create new value for customers. So Rolls-Royce has been, been covered for many years about how they put sensors in engines and change their business model from essentially selling engines and parts to essentially leasing hours of propulsion because they can predict when an engine is going to fail and they can pre-position parts on the ground before the engine needs, fails. They can get maintenance done in advance and they can provide that service to customers so rather than selling them the engine, they can essentially lease the hours of propulsion. It changed the, it changed the industry. GE's followed suit. They've done the same thing. But that ability to put sensors, IoT, into products and services, collect data, and provide pro proactive service to customers is, a, is an important way that companies are thinking about how to change their relationship with the customer and how to change the value that's created. Companies like uh, Sephora went out and acquired Sensor because they wanted to create a new digital capability for their organization. So if you don't have the digital capability, you can go out and acquire it by acquiring a company that's doing innovative things in the space. One of the reasons why Sephora acquired Sensor is because they didn't want the competitors to get that capability. So think about how you can source your enhanced operational capabilities. And think about how to design these high-value experiences. So um, Rebecca Minkoff in New York, for example, a small fashion retailer, are experimenting with a digital dressing room. They have RFID tags on all the product. So when a customer takes their product into the dressing room, the mirror automatically populates with every product they have in the dressing room. And they can select different sizes. They can select different other products they don't have that are part of a different assortment that will go better with that, the products they have. They want to build an assortment together. And when they select a different size, they don't have to go out of the dressing room and go find it. Their personal shopping assistant will go, to the, go around the store and pick up the things bring it to the dressing room for them, changing the experience for the customer, creating a higher value experience, saving the customer time. The one thing you've got to be aware of is actually setting expectations with the digital experiences beyond the operational capabilities of the business. So I started out with telling you about how last week I could open a hotel door with uh, my smartphone. Well, my first experience of this was actually last year. And the, the, the truth is, the first experience was not great. So when I opened my hotel door, that's fine, it all worked great. I went out for dinner that night with some clients, and I had a few drinks, as one does at dinner. I did not use the restroom in the, um, in the uh, restaurant. I thought, well, I'm going back to the hotel, I'll just use my hotel room, as you do. Um, and so I got back. by the time I got back to my hotel room, I kind of needed to go to the to the toilet. So um, 
you, you know how uncomfortable that can be, right? So you, you kind of put yourself in that mindset. So I get my phone out to unlock the door, right? Which, which okay, it's cool. Except it won't unlock the door. I'm like, hmm, not good. Okay, now I pull out my plastic key, because I got a plastic key when I checked in. Try that. That won't unlock the door either. Oh, this is really not good. So uh, putting, you know, uh, priorities first, biological priorities come first. I went down to the lobby, went to the restroom, went to the toilet, and fine, sorted out that. I feel a lot more comfortable now. Um, and then I went to the, I went to the uh, registration and said, so my, my phone won't unlock the door. And they said, are you on Wi-Fi? I looked and my phone wasn't on the Wi-Fi. Like, oh, your phone needs to be on the Wi-Fi to open, unlock the door. Oh, well, A, it might have been nice to have been told this. <laughs> But B, the infrastructure in the hotel wasn't designed to automatically reconnect the phone as soon as you came back into the hotel onto the Wi-Fi. So they created an experience that was potentially a great experience, but they hadn't put the operational infrastructure in place to actually deliver the experience consistently. And if you don't do that, you can deliver a really bad experience for customers. And so it's really important to create that experience that has value. Uh, the hotel chain that, that did this has since actually fixed that, and now they don't need to be on Wi-Fi anymore to unlock the door, which is kind of cool. So what I encourage you to do is to build your digital DNA to design the experiences that deliver the outcomes that satisfy the desires. You've got to do this day in, day out. Think about how you can create your, enhance your digital DNA and build a better customer experience to deliver those outcomes and satisfy desires. Thank you very much. But thank you very much. That was really inspiring. And, um, you know, I thought what I would do is maybe just ask a few questions a little bit about maybe tying that to what it means for other organizations. Um, and so, you know, I think um, one of the things that I thought would be really interesting to talk about is what kind of dialogue needs to take place um, between company executives, maybe the line of business managers, and the IoT executives or leadership to develop that strategy for driving customer value. And then um, uh, also, I think, um, well, actually, let's, let's start with there and, and really you know, talk about the discussions that actually need to take place within the organization and maybe some examples of, yeah. of good ways to make that happen. So, so one of the challenges, I, I often get questions from CIOs who say, okay, my CEO doesn't get it, you know, how, do we, how do we have that conversation? Or, or how do I have the conversation with the CMO? Um, I, I think the very first thing that has to happen is there's got to be a level of trust that's developed at the, at the C-suite. Um, and if that's not there, then you know, it's kind of like go back to basics. Um, but once you get an understanding of everybody's trying to achieve the same thing, um, then you can start moving the ball forward in terms of understanding what's possible. If the CEO is, is kind of stuck in the, you know, we're not a digital business and we, and we don't think that way, then just taking them to see examples of other companies doing other things um, is really helpful. So not in the same industry, but typically going in and doing sort of a digital safari around uh, other companies that are doing things differently, right? So you take examples of companies that are doing transformation in other industries, and, and, and it helps for CEOs to talk to other CEOs to understand the journey they went through. Um, and and from, a, from a sort of a, an IT leadership perspective, if you're, a, a, you're sort of an IT leader, you're not the CIO, and you're working in IT, and often the question is, well, what can I do to change? Um, and very often it's, it's about helping change that conversation. Change the conversation away from uh, this project that somebody wants to get done to understanding the customer and how the customer actually perceives value, which is a conversation you really have to have with typically the marketing team or the customer experience team and become a real partner with marketing and understanding how to drive that outcome. Once, once the marketing team understands that the IT team wants to get to the same outcome as they want to, they're, they're in a position to build a better partnership across those two organizations. So there's a lot more synergy between marketing and IT than most people realize. And uh, the, the opportunity to create that uh, combined force, if you like, inside the organization can certainly help shift the thinking on the, on the senior team as well. So if the, if the CMO and the CIO are aligned together and thinking about how to create value for customers through digital, that can help change the perception across the rest of the business team as well. Um, and you know, one of the things, and this is sort of a little bit of an expansion on that, because I think, 
that if you conceptually as a business want to um, become that predator and, and you've sort of conceptually put in the big picture, but then there's sort of the, the if you will, the strategic execution of that. How do you, um, you know, identify the outcomes that are going to, um, you know, really tie into the customer desires? And how do you foster those discussions with business and marketing and the IT team that is really going to help you to execute? And if the IT um, executives or, or you know, team aren't involved in that discussion today, what can they do to help insert themselves into that so that they can really become the enablers at this earlier stage of, of you know, identifying those outcomes and helping to figure out how to address them? So you've got to start with uh, changing the perspective of the organization. So most organizations today still work inside out. Um, and it's true of, of an amazing number of companies, uh, even companies that profess to be helping their clients change to digital transformation. And I sit with their marketing teams and, they, and you look at it and, and their whole focus is inside out. They're, in other words, their product focus. They look at the product and figure out how do we communicate that to the market. Instead of actually turning from the outside in and saying, what is it that actually our customer is trying to achieve? What's the outcome? And, and how do we deliver that outcome today, but how could we better deliver that outcome tomorrow? And so you have to start with that, that shift in framework so the sh or, or shift in thinking to become truly outside in. Right? And that allows you to look at things like customer journey mapping, which many in, in the IT group don't do and need to do. They need to understand journey mapping and, and have that as a, a core capability along with things like design thinking. Those capabilities then give them the, the credibility to have conversations with their peers in the marketing group and the lines of business to have uh, a discussion about what it means to create that value, that outside in value for customers, and how technology can help with that. So it's not that I think business leaders or, or marketers typically uh, don't want to do work with the IT group. A lot of times it's historic. They see the IT group as, okay, well, they just kind of like always say no, or they throw out so many barriers that you know, we can't get anything done, or it just takes too long, and all of those kind of things. But the, the technology groups are changing, they're evolving, they're becoming uh, much better at delivering faster outcomes, you know, delivering uh, faster releases, understanding how the, you know, the, to, to apply these things. So once you have that capability, is you become a, a much better partner to have that conversation, but you have to do it with customers. And that's the key challenge is that many companies are still like trying to do it internally instead of bringing the customers inside the organization and saying, okay, what do you need? What are you trying to do? Tell us about what it is that you're trying to achieve. What is it that you value? And having those conversations with customers is so important to changing the dynamic of the business. And it's not just marketers that need to have those conversations. The technology group needs to do that too. So the really high-performing technology teams, one of the characteristics I see of CIOs in those groups is they're always saying not only for themselves, but for everybody in the team, we have everybody go out and meet customers whether they're sitting, on a, on a, on a, sitting in on phone calls or on a service desk, or they're going out with salespeople, or they're, you know, if they're retail, inside stores, it's they're getting in front of customers to understand what the customers are doing. And that customer focus, that customer obsession, is what changes the conversation inside the organization. So, and that's really interesting because you're moving beyond just thinking, well, I'm going to have a focus group or I'm going to have an executive customer roundtable discussion or forum to actually getting out in, into with the retail place or the manufacturing site or the whatever to get that personal experience. Yeah, and it's a lot of technologists will say, well, you know, it's, I, I don't. I don't meet with customers. You know, I, I deal with the internal customer. I hate that, that whole thing about the internal customer. It's like the real customer is the, the person who pays the bills, right? And, and the, you're a partner with the employees and, uh, to do that. So understanding what it is that we're doing for that customer and how, that, how we're creating value for that customer today allows people in the IT group to become really innovative, right? Because there's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of creativity in the IT group. And they just need to be able to understand how to apply that. And very often, it's as simple as getting those people in front of the customer, and they can say, you know what, if we do this, this, and this, we can actually not only fix touch points, maybe we can remove touch points completely from that customer experience. 
and replace it with something that's much better, much higher value for customers. So that ability to, to be creative, to be innovative, and help the business units deliver that is really what separates the high-performing predators from those companies that are still struggling to transform. Great. Well, I, that is some really good information.